Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 37. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Another great interview for you coming up. But first, I want to remind you that if you are a small business owner, you want to listen up to this. Uh, manage those small business finances. Actually, take them to the next level so that you can focus on growing your business. With QuickBooks Online, they handle everything. Use this special link we've got for you to get 50% off your subscription. That's the knifejunkie.com slash quickbooks. You can get either 50% off on QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Self-Employed for the first six months of either one. Get started with QuickBooks Self-Employed or QuickBooks Online today. Again, that 50% special discount link is the knifejunkie.com slash quickbooks. And Bob, another great uh, show for us today on the Knife Junkie podcast. Who, who, who are you going to talk to? Yeah, Jim, this week I'm speaking to uh, one of my favorite YouTubers of all time, Nick Shabazz. Nick has become kind of the last word in knife reviewing uh, in a lot of ways there. Um, he, he has a very scientific breakdown to how he uh, judges a knife or any other gear. He also looks at pens and watches, which he tells me, do not go down that hole uh, because it's an expensive one. Uh, so yeah, Nick, Nick Shabazz not only brings uh, a very structured, tried and true structure to his reviews, but he's an entertaining guy and funny and interesting and obviously really darn smart. And, uh, it was great talking to him mm -hmm. and uh, great to kind of get a peek behind the, behind the mind that, uh, kind of turns out these videos and what he's thinking and his criteria and a lot, a lot of great, uh, knife conversation there. Exactly, Jim. You know, it's funny uh, talking with all of these people, especially the uh, the YouTube critics and uh, connoisseurs. I've seen so many of their videos. By the time I talk to them, I almost feel like I know them. And uh, uh, so it's it's cool to already have a um, I don't know to feel like I'm already in the conversation when the conversation starts. Right. Well, speaking of conversation, that conversation with Nick is coming up next. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. If I'm remembering correctly, you're an engineer from the videos I've seen, I, I believe. Or So I, I'm a, I think the better place to put it is I'm a research scientist. Just knowing that you're a scientist, I think um, because your format, the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly, is very, I, I think uh, one of the reasons I keep tuning into you is that it's, I know every time when I'm going to get it, it's the same but different. You know, it's like yeah, Hollywood in a way. Yeah, exactly. I try my best to keep it at least relatively often to that format. Um, and it's, it served me well. So what about knives? Where did that come from for you? So, okay. Um, it, it was a long route ahead. I, for a long time, you know, basically as long as I was able to do so and cause you know, zero tolerance things and, you know, in high school and things like that. But anytime I wasn't at school, I had on me, uh, for a long time, like the little Leatherman squirt P4. This is the little tiny Leatherman that really does belong well on a keychain, has the pliers, has the pocket knife, has the, you know, little tiny, what, inch and a quarter blade or something like that. Chisel ground, him. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, chisel ground. It, and, oh, God, the, 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 the sharpening jobs that occurred to that poor blade, that was a shame. But, you know, for a long time, I had, you know, one of those in my life, and I was always a gadget geek as well. Like I was, a, you know, a 12 year old who would go to the shopper image and just be like, wow, look at that keychain. It's like I don't have keys, but here I am. And so um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and that crossbow. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how could you not? Um, and so, you know, for me, it was like I had I, I had these tools in my life. And, you know, I had a machete. Did I have a jungle? No, but I had a machete. <laughs> um, and so it was always there. It was always that undercurrent of gear geek at the, the and so I was happy for a long time just with a little, you know, Leatherman squirt. But then I realized I got a Leatherman wave just because, you know, I wanted to do a little bit of an upgrade there. I had, you know, a crappy hardware store multi-tool at some point back and then realized, holy crap, this knife is super useful. Because, you know, having a, a locking blade is, you know, different. Changes everything. Yeah, yeah it changes and especially one of a reasonable size with one hand open. Oh, yeah. And so then I, I remember I went on to freaking Reddit um, and there who screwed me over eventually. It started off on, um, you know, the knives subreddit. And then eventually once it happened, Knife Club, 
And I just started looking and I looked and I looked and I looked. It was like, holy crap. I remember thinking to myself, looking at like a Benchmade uh, uh, 940 and thinking to myself, what the heck kind of idiot pays 125 <laughs> bucks back in the day for a Benchmade 940? Who would spend that money on a knife? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Unconscionable. Unconscionable. And in fact, I am so dumb that I even at one point in time spent 125 bucks at the time on a 940. And then upon realizing that it would be illegal in my particular municipality, mm. returned it. Mm. I had a 940 for 125 bucks. <laughs> I later ended up moving and buying a new one at, you know, full freaking bill map retail. But oh, yeah. If I can't have you, I don't made. want nobody, baby. I'm leaving town. Exactly. Somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. And so by that point, I, I realized, you know, holy crap, handling, you know, some bench maids early on, the occasional spider coat was just like, oh, my God, this is so much better than everything I've seen before. And by the time, as you well know, when you start carrying an edge tool, you just find uses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it after a while, it becomes you, there's that feeling of nudity with it without it, where it's just like, oh, God, oh, how am I opening this package right now? What's wrong? And, you know, that by then it was just like, I'm, I'm on the gear geeking train with it. And it's, it was over. I understand that completely. But, but one thing, okay. So I have to admit to you, I'm coming at it from a high speed, low drag orientation. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm not saying that I am that individual. I'm not jumping out of airplanes. I'm not shooting people, you know, with silencers. Um, oh, you're, you're not using the silencer then. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. no, no. I'm I'm going all out. Good to know. I'll, at least I'll hear you coming. <laughs> no, my, my my point is like, uh, you know, I got my like most people, I got my love knife first from my grandpa, but then second from Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, yeah. uh, Predator, and also uh, you know to to a lesser degree uh, Stallone. But it was those movies when I was a kid, you know, uh, that 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 really hardened that that love for me. So I've always always approached. I, I can't help it. I've always approached my love for knives, whether it's like a classy gents piece or or a, a big honking uh, uh, belt knife, from the perspective of you know how could I how could I survive with this? How could I <laughs> kill the predator with this knife? And, and that's who I am. I can't. I, you know, sometimes it, no I, shame you know. in it. So, was there ever that fascination for you? So I, in many ways, um, my very first pocket knife uh, was given to me as a part of like Cub Scout training, right? I, I ended up moving, so I didn't complete, you know, uh, moving to a school that didn't have a, a scout troop or anything. So I didn't go any further with it uh, past then. But for me, it was always, you know, introduced to me as tools. And, you know, my folks were uh, very much, you know, they were always out in the garden. They were always out. And so there was never really, um, I, I know it, like freaking a priori that, you know, knives, they, they are also weapons. If you choose to use them in that way and you have the adequate training to use them. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, that's for the rest of the people. Um, sure. But, you know, for me, there was not, there's not really that element to it. I mean, sure. If you are in a dock parking lot or something like that in a relatively sketchy area, you might, you know, have your hand on a knife and, mm -hmm. you know, be ready for that. But at the same time, for me, they're tools. And I, you know, that's cliche, but I very much feel that, right. you know, for me, the, the biggest threat in my life at the boxes, envelopes, and the occasional pencil I got a shot in, you know? <laughs> yeah. Is that an um, errant thread on your uh, collar I see there, Nick? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, it's not, because I got rid of it already. <laughs> <laughs> With my Kirby Lambert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You bust out your four-inch damage steel blade for that errant thread. And so, yeah. you know, we're breaking down boxes, that kind of thing. Cutting foam. I got a lot of foam. So, you know, all of those things are, uh, for me, it's, it, it, that's not the way I've approached it. I acknowledge it to be mm -hmm. the case. And I try to be fair to that in my reviewing, yeah. uh, you know, but it's always going to be, I'm going to miss the point of every damn Emerson on my table. I know that. And different grinds for different kinds, right? Absolutely. Actually, you, um, you coined a few phrases. I'm not sure if you coined them, but <laughs> But to me, you did uh, fall shuddy is one of them, but murdery is one. And I use that really? a lot because, yeah, because I'll, I'll bring, you know, I'm, I, I get new knives frequently and I have yep. people that I can go to and say, check out my new knife. And yeah. uh, murdery is a term that comes up. I know it looks a little murdery for the office, so keep it low, but that is a word I got from you. And, and, and all that means to me is 
something that looks uh, a little bit more than just a tool that you would use to cut paper, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's always the, there's that tension. You know, I get a lot of flack for that term in two ways. And I understand it to an extent. Mm-hmm. You know, some people are saying things to me like, oh, well, you should never use that term because it's just reinforcing a negative stereotype a knife uses. And like, OK, like I'm the person reinforcing that negative stereotype. Really? Really? But I, I digress. The other issue that I think is maybe a more reasonable one is that, you know, if we don't ever think about it in that way, people won't think about it in that way, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I've always disagreed with that because I think there's a level to which and and there's the third option of, you know, and you get this. Well, I'm a man. I I carry what I want to at work. And, you know, let the HR people trot me down. I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. Exactly. Yeah. And you get those folks out there who are just so they're they're lone wolf. Every part of them is just, you know, (laughs) the lone wolf is sheeting off them. Um, And and so, you know, those folks, that's a life they're welcome to have. But I think for the majority of people, at least in my region of the world, it's kind of important to think of there are knives that you wouldn't take out to cut a a thread off your collar in a Starbucks. I mean, so that's something to consider. So this brings me to uh, uh, something that came out of your recent uh, review of Blade Show 2019, (laughs) um, which was, uh, I don't know if you put it this way, but this is how I wrote it in my notes, basically the ethics of being at a a knife show. Talk about the Bally Boys flipping their razor sharp knives around uh, like it's a circus, and uh, uh, well, we'll talk about some other things, but but you were we're kind of talking about safety right now, and, yeah. And so I, I on one hand, I was like, man, I know I know what it's like to feel. I mean, I have scars all over my body from years of feeling overly confident with knives. Yeah. Uh, I I have done a fair bit of martial arts and and then a fair bit of drunken showing off in my youth. <laughs> Um, I have the scars to show it. And uh, it's a serious deal because yeah. everything comes down to luck in life. Yeah. Greatly. Uh, we all do things and get by because we have good luck. But you're swinging a knife around. You could have very bad luck and Nick, Nick Shabazz's wrist or something yeah, exactly. really dangerous, you know. Yeah, there'd be a, a great, a great cheer from the manufacturers. But yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, so what, what do you feel the ethics of going to like a blade show or, or a gathering like that are? One thing I want to make very clear is that I don't I do respect the skill involved with acrobatic balisong flipping. No doubt. I, it's absolutely 100 percent amazing. And I think there's a I don't want to make it sound by saying Bally Boys. I'm not talking about everyone who carries a balisong. I'm talking about the little jerks who would do it in a crowd. Yeah. And they, they tend to be little. It tends to be, you know, and I, I understand that at another level, like this is the one place on earth where it is societally acceptable to walk through a crowd of adults flipping a ballad song. Like I get that completely a hundred percent. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think there is an ethical, there's this, and I, I think I said this, but this is the one place on earth we should be most cognizant of knife safety where we should band together as a hobby and say, you know what, we're going to go through this whole damn show and not get cut. You know, if the paramedics just stay really bored, we have succeeded as a society. (laughs) Yeah. And, and if, if knives don't get knives, don't get banned at a knife show, we've also succeeded, you know? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've been to too many places, you know, like Renaissance festivals where they, you know, make you put, you know, uh, they zip tie the the dagger, even if it's a fake dagger, you know, into the the sheath. And it's just like, I worry desperately that somebody is going, that that there's going to end up being some kind of a legal policy that makes that mandated. And that'll just be awful if that happens. Well, we we go to an annual uh, Renaissance festival, uh, right? outside of dc and you can't wear anything approximating a weapon now and i'm i'm yeah. thinking the renaissance was all about weapons <laughs> yeah that's maybe i'm just yeah. no i I'm, I'm with you i think there's a little bit of uh i understand both perspectives of it but particularly at a knife show and already if you look yeah. at their uh their, their website on the policy there's something like i forget what it says but it's something like any knives must be brought in to show a dealer or uh, to show a manufacturer. And it's like, okay, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But I, I really, really would hate to see that become, you know, a, a knife-free zone, except for all the ones on the table. 
I mean, that would just be the ultimate absurdity. Yeah. Can't let that happen. I, I want to get back to Blade in a minute, but before sure. we do, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is Gear Geeks? And uh, tell me about some of your, you, you were involved with um, Knife News doing Knife Grapes, which was, yeah. uh, which was, oh man, that was nourishing. I love that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> tell me about your outside projects a little bit outside of the Nick Shabazz. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I've got my YouTube channel. Um, I've got Instagram, which is where I do a lot of just random jackassing. I mean, if you're ever curious about my, you know, what's coming up on the channel, it, actually Instagram is I'll very often post, you know, this is what's in my pocket today, or this particular spring is a jerk. Or something like that. Um, and, you know, so I, I go there. Um, for a while, I was working with Knife News. Um, I did my Knife Gripes with Nick Shabazz series, and I ended up doing two articles. Um, some things changed there, and I'm, I'm not imputing the organization at all, but I think they decided they wanted to take it a different direction. Um, and so I'm not working with them again, but there are no hard feelings. And if they reached out to me, I'd be happy to pick things back up. Um but yeah, the Knife Gripe series was sort of a, we did 50 episodes. And by 50, I kind of decided everything else that was on my list was kind of like, eh, I, I know, thought it, I thought it actually had a nice lifespan. It, it yeah. went on. It, it was almost a year, I guess, 50 yeah. episodes. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and, you know, at a certain point, it's like, how far are you going to reach for a exactly. gripe? Like, but I, I really, I think that's a good kind of library yeah. uh, of, of, Things that if you're getting into this as a hobby and it's something you're going to spend your money on, I, I think it's kind of a valuable um, because you're a respected. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you are. No. I like two you're, people. You're, yes. You are a respected authority in this field. <laughs> in, yes. Well, in terms of uh, the consumer side, no sure. doubt, and the user side. And uh, so I think uh, most people are approaching it from that uh, orientation. And so to have 50 videos that kind of catalog the things that more experienced collectors are concerned about uh, could really shave off some time and money from, you know, the beginning awkward part where you're yeah. getting every cheap Kershaw you can afford. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I look at that series as being partly designed for those people to see, you know, these are things you should look for when you're handling a potential purchase, but also potentially for a young knife maker. Um, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who is, uh, new to the, the process, my hope, and I've got also a checklist. It's nickshabazz.com slash checklist where I've kind of put a bunch of those things together mm -hmm. that just, you know, or a bunch of the things that bother me and are, are common design issues that I see with pocket knives. And so mm -hmm. part of my goal there, and this is a little cocky, but at, at a level would just be for somebody who is just getting into knife design to watch that series and fix something. Hmm. That they they re didn't realize they hadn't thought about because yeah. the thing with doing, as you understand, once you get into this hobby long enough, you pick something up and you're like, oh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. Where you might have taken two weeks to figure that out earlier in your time, now it's easier to make that call, right? Yeah. All you have to do is set it on the table, and you can hear by how it sounds. Uh oh. Yeah. Exactly. About how that yeah, I'm not liking how that detent sounds. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or or just the like. I think I heard it hit the liner. I know it's close, but I think I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so in terms of feedback, like yeah. what, what is the makers slash manufacturers? I know that might be different because a maker, you yeah, think of as a customer, but what is their responsibility to assimilating feedback? Is that more uh, a, a self-preservation issue or is that a, is that something they should be doing? Is that a moral issue from a, oh, from a, I mean, from a productive moral standpoint? issue? Uh, I, I, you know what I, I mean? Know what I you're mean saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of makers took very – doing that series was actually very interesting because I got a lot of feedback from a bunch of people. Um, there were some makers that actually kind of grew close into me as a part of that. Um, makers – and by that, I mean they reached out. They would say something like, hey, I've been loving your Knife Gripe series, et cetera. And you know, those tended to be the people who didn't have a problem anyways, um, which makes sense, right? Uh, right? Sure. Otherwise, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so those folks were the people who were already kind of on board with it, definitely kind of reached out. And uh, certainly with some of them, there was something that hit pretty much everybody in that. I can think of nobody who was left completely unchastised by that series. Right. Um, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, so there's that element. But um, there were also some makers uh, who were very unhappy with it, uh, relatively few. But, uh, you know, a couple of people reached out or actually most of them just said publicly, 
you know, oh, what an idiot. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. One very common thing is, do you have any idea how hard it is to do all of these things right? Not your problem. Not your problem. I, you know, and I kind of, I, I'm very sympathetic. And, you know, the, the couple of people I heard this from were relatively new custom makers. And look, I, I get it at some level, but I also feel like some of the things that, and this particular person, I'm not going to name names because they'd be tacky, but, you know, and he's also improved a great deal, but this particular person had a number of the gripes going on mm-hmm. um, and they were serious problems. And so, like, I get at some level that it's got to feel like an attack personally, if I'm saying this shouldn't be the case. Yeah. But, you know, that that was very frustrating and I understand it, but that was tough. I have to say, coming up through an art paradigm, I went through art school and, and received much criticism, you know, all throughout. That's part of it. I have to say, when you're when you're making something and putting it out into the world, you don't have to listen to and assimilate every bit of criticism that comes, but you have to consider it yeah. uh, because these are the people who are spending money, you know, up, and, and, and if it's something this personal, they're spending a lot of money because it's somewhat custom yeah. and uh, you need to pay attention to that. It's not just art hanging on the wall whose only uh, purpose is to be appreciated. It, it is also a tool. It's something you're holding yeah. in your hand and you're using and, and could potentially harm you. So yeah, you, know, you got to listen to that stuff. Well, and that's the, that's the other line I draw is, you know, it's one thing to say, I don't like where you put the lanyard hole or that, you know, that blade shape isn't attractive to me. And, you know, I tried my best to avoid in that series things that were very subjective, mm-hmm. um, except, you know, tip, tip down Gary, that's wrong. Um <laughs> I'm sorry. I, it's, Unless yeah. it's a microtech. So no, nope, it's still wrong. Still wrong. <laughs> okay. okay. That did, no exceptions. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, I tried to avoid those things, but there is a level at which I'm afraid. Uh, and I tried to tune that series very much so that it, those were things I would recommend become universal law, mm-hmm. right? Like all of those things that I re- mentioned there, I really genuinely think that if everybody did them, the world would be a slightly better place. I tried to make them not so subjective or just make like, you know, phrase it in terms of not like make all knives small, but hey, make some small knives. Right. You know, those kinds of things. Um, it seems to work out well when they do. Exactly. Yeah. And it gives a great. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I really tried my best to, to, to avoid that. But I'm also very cognizant of the fact that I have one. I'm, I'm reluctant to be called an expert or, a, you know, a taste maker or whatever the heck people have influence. Oh, God. Um, it, it, but because I am just one person, right? I, I have a set of feelings about knives and they're not correct. They're just mine. And being loud is not the same thing as being correct. And I am loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're loud. But but uh, also you approach it from a scientific standpoint. I, I think that has something to do with your occupation. But sure. you're approaching it from... Uh, um, it's not erratic or emotional. Let me let me put it that way. And I am an, I can be both. <laughs> and, yeah. and and in my knife selection, I'm what looks good to me. Oftentimes wins out. I feel like with you, you approach it with a level and even keel each time. And I think that's probably why you're respected. I mean, also you're a human being and you're intelligent sure. and all that other stuff. Thank but I think much. I think the reason people really come to you is that. Every time you're going to get the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly, and yeah. you're going to and 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 each time, if there's no ugly, there's no ugly. But you yeah. still talk about it. You still get there. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your criteria for evaluating a knife and uh, uh, outside of your personal taste. No, that's a really excellent question. Um, so when I sit down with something brand new, um, my biggest immediately. Usually I kind of figure out the great and the ugly pretty quick Mm. Um, because those, you know, the ugly is, and by the way, just to define, a lot of folks ask what's the difference between bad and ugly. For me, bad is something that I don't care for, but I can see not being a problem for somebody. Mm -hmm. And the ugly is the stuff that is just not okay. And there is no situation that makes it okay. Um, I can sometimes violate that if it's something that I find super distasteful personally. But I try to make that distinction of like, this is really ugly to me, but it may not be for you. Um, but there's just that element of like bad can be like something being very expensive can be bad or it can be ugly. Um, if it's bad, it's like, I'm not willing to pay this, but I can see somebody who is. Mm-hmm. And if it's ugly, it's just like, this is not okay in any way, shape or form. What are you yeah, they're trying to get one over on you with this? Exactly. Yeah. And so. Especially you mentioned out of my personal kind of something out of my personal range. Um, 
and I'm trying to think of a nice example of a, a knife that I've reviewed that was so far out of my domain that it was difficult. I think I have one. Yeah, what do you got? You mentioned uh, you you reviewed I think the Cold Steel Frenzy. Cold and you Steel, read- I won the Frenzy, but I've reviewed a couple of the the tie light, the Espada XL. A couple of the the ridiculously yeah. large. By the way, I have a collection of those. I love those. nice. Oh uh, yeah, but- sure. But I, I, I remember you saying, like, for what it is, it's outstanding. What yeah. it is, is absurd. <laughs> but, yeah, 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 yeah. And I try and put myself as best I can in the mindset of, you know, okay, I don't think that this needs to be a thing. Although, in that case, I, I'm not saying that. I think it's a beautiful thing that Cold Steel is making the Espada XLs because no one else is going <laughs> to. Um, so, you know, I but I try to – I do my best, and I fail at this sometimes, but I do my best. Or another one would be like the Spyderco Yojimbo too. Or another knife that is explicitly self-defense marketed. I love that knife. <laughs> oh, look. Yeah. But that those kinds of knives, or the, the, the PPT or whatever it was, those knives really stress my ability to do this because fundamentally the, the use case for them is not the use case I have. Uh, and so I try to think about them both in terms of what is, you know, I can still talk about these things as a functional everyday carry tool. And sometimes I say, I'm going to aggressively miss the point here. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the boxes and the envelopes and the, when in reality, this is meant to end up in some guy's spleen. Yeah. But, you know, I, I will focus that way. And, I, but I think that some of the basics, the fundamentals are still reviewable in all of these things. You know, how is the fit and finish? How is the construction? Right. How is the steel? How are the ergonomics? Those are things that I think I can address no matter what. And, you know, I can give an opinion about how something is, even if it's not in my domain, or even if I find the knife really, really freaking ugly, um, you know, I can still talk about it. I can still potentially provide some useful information, but I try to stick to the analytical stuff, the detail oriented stuff that I, that seems to be a strength for me. And well, and that's also something that anyone, no matter what their approach is, uh, can come to it. Uh, you know, yeah. for, for, for me, the Yojimbo 2, yes, it was created by a tactical guy for tactical stuff, but it's also, it's an awesome utility knife because it's like carrying around a giant mat knife, you know, a yeah, giant, yeah, yeah. you know. So um, I, I, I think that uh, giving it that neutral kind of uh, look at its fit and finish and its and, and how it functions as what it is, is good for people because they might be coming at it for a totally different reason. You know, you might have someone yeah. just coming at it because it's got the compression lock and and it's a sweet, you know, looking thing. Absolutely. Well, and that's the other reason you mentioned my format, you know, the good, the great, the bad, the ugly. Um, yeah. That part of the reason I do that is having an intro and a conclusion as well as that is because that allows me to sort of separate out these things. Um, mm-hmm. I There is a class of comments that I love and very much respect of people saying, you are entirely wrong about your conclusion of this knife, but I learned a lot from your review. Thank you. Hmm. Or people saying like, you said this is bad. I say that's good. Thanks for pointing it out to me. Where it's like, I I know that people are intelligent humans who are watching my reviews and can decide, you know, if I say I don't like the size of this, they might be here and, oh my God, I'm going to love the size for this. Or yeah, exactly. For me, I know if it's Kevin Cleary, I'm going to agree with him on size. You know, yeah. because I like bigger knives. And, uh, and, uh, if it's you, if it's too big, I'm probably like, ah, that's probably right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And some people are going to be looking at it. I'm going to say, oh, this is really murdery. They're going to be great. <laughs> so, you know, I, that's, that's really the image I'm trying to cultivate here, you know? Exactly. And so I hope that my reviews are at least detail oriented enough that I'm pointing, I'm teaching somebody about the knife, uh, uh, teaching them something about the knife that they didn't know previously from like looking at product photos even if they end up deciding their conclusion is entirely different than mine, even if they decide, you know what, that's the dumbest knife I've ever seen, but he loves it, or that's the best knife I've ever seen and he hates it, they still come away from the video having gotten something out of my review. That That's why I try to do that is to, you know, give both an opinion and some facts or at least some highlights of the piece, positive and negative. Right. So... Uh- I, I want to get to Blade Show. I want to talk. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this year, uh, uh, I was the first year that I ever considered going, and uh, I couldn't because ah. of uh, work obligations, and it, it uh, burned yeah. me up. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. It's yeah. So yeah. so your your video, uh, your recent video, and a, and a few others were really valuable to me. Um, uh, 
before we go there, yeah. um, I, I just wanted to ask you about uh, what you feel is kind of the new standard in knives these days. What are people going to a show like Bla- before we get to Blade Show itself? Yeah. What are people going to Blade Show for, in your opinion? What are they going to Blade Show for? In terms of like what what are the predominant knives people are looking for? You know, at some level, Blade Show the, the Blade experience is a very different thing because the cool part about Blade Show and the reason I the thing that I tell people to go to Blade Show for if they're in the hobby is because you see everything. Like people will go there and they might have in mind, you know, I want to pick up, well, I'm at Blade Show as a souvenir. I want to pick up, uh, you know, Spyderco PM2, or I want to pick up a brand new. But honestly, for me, uh, and what I generally recommend is that people go for an excuse to handle everything. Even if you walk, I, and some people think I'm crazy here, but if you walk into Blade Show, and there's the custom side, I think that's what a lot of people go to Blade Show for, mm-hmm. is like they've seen, a Gareth Bull Shamwari that's going to be at Blade and they want it and they're waiting in line at, you know, at night. But I think the more valuable part is being able to walk in there. It would be perfectly reasonable to walk into Blade show completely broke and you would still take a lot out of the experience because you get to handle every damn thing. You get to walk into basically a knife shop that has every skew of every company's knives just right there. And you get to go through and you'd like, Oh, I've always been curious about the, you know, Spideco Yojimbo, but at my local shops never had one. Can I see it? They hand it to you. Oh, I've never heard of A.G. Russell. What do they do? You walk over there, you're like, oh, I like this, or maybe not. Oh, I've never handled a Rayot before. Holy crap. You know, so you get to see all of this crazy stuff on the high end and the middle end, and, and you get to hold it in hand. You get to, because you said already, I mean, once you get to a point in the hobby, it's like you hear it and you're like, oh, I want that. Mm-hmm. You see it on the table and you're just like, oh, that's not going to fit my hand. Or you see things in pictures that are great, and then you'd see them on the table. You're just like, oh, my God, no, et cetera. Or you feel it in your hand, and it's just not for you because it's – Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I could have saved so much money by going to Blade Show early in my in my life, so to speak, of just yeah. like, oh, wow, no, nope, nobody, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned something interesting, um, and, and I, this is now more leaning back towards the ethics yeah. of Blade Show. You talked about the early sellout of custom oh. makers and, yeah. and what a buzzkill that is because you're showing up and you've come all this way and you're like, man, I just want to get my hands on a y- you fill in the blank yeah. because it's it's a little richer than my blood right now, but I want to see if it's something I want to save up for or exactly. whatever. And they're all gone. <sighs> Speaking as uh, as a an artist and speaking as someone who has uh, been a freelancer before, if you will, like the opportunity to sell everything right away is very tempting. So what, what's your argument for not doing that? So I get that completely. And I, I, I am sure that in many cases there is somebody standing there with a wad of cash offering you twice table for it right now. And I totally get why as an artist, as a maker, that would be really hard to say no to. And that's part of the reason why I, I, I would argue that at some level there's the bird in hand is worth two in the bush, right? And the guy who doesn't have the money today but might have the money next year is a bird in the bush, 100%. Yeah. And so I, I, I get that. And that's kind of why I recommend that makers think about it a little bit differently. Like I encourage makers to do things like I've seen makers who bring uh, – who have people bring knives to them for spa service and then have them on the table. So that they other people could check them out, but they're not for sale. Just exactly. Like, oh, yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. And there is no question as to whether they're for sale or to do things like there's an auction on Sunday. This knife is not for sale. It will be auctioned. You're welcome to do that on Instagram or otherwise. But for the moment, here you go. Take, take a look or to hold one skew in reserve. You also mentioned that as a great tactic to keep people on Sundays, which is a yeah. Kind of a ghost town, I guess. I mean, it's not a ghost town. If you're on the production side, Sunday is a perfectly reasonable day. But there are right. definitely a right. bunch of people who just don't show up for their custom table on Sunday, or, right. or who even fly home on Sunday. Meaning, meaning the production companies have a lot of product and they're there the whole time. But yeah. the small, smaller, uh, or custom makers, when they sell out, they're, sure. they're done. Okay. Yeah, and even the production companies. I mean, if you're wanting something that's you know the new hotness, they're going to be gone pretty quick too. But they'll usually still keep one in the case. For you to take a look at and some companies don't even have stock to sell they'll you know bring you know four of each knife have them in the case and ready 
but their goal is not to sell directly to clients. Their goal is to let people handle them and sell to dealers, right. things like that. So if you're a production person, Sunday's actually a good day because um, <laughs> there are fewer people there and, you know, Everybody. Less competition for the for the flashier stuff in terms exactly, of uh, yeah. eye, eye time and hand time. So yeah. um, so if money were no issue and you could go and and get one fixed blade and one and one Ooh. we'll call it we'll call it a modern tactical folder or yeah. not tactical but a modern sure. folder and then one slip joint. What would you what would those three be? Okay, um, if money were no issue and availability were no issue, I'll exactly. put that one on the table too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fixed blades. Oh God, there were some really amazing. Like I have no use for a gigantic Damascus Bowie knife. There is no point in my life that that will ever come up as like, wow, I could use one of these guys. But if somebody handed me their credit card and said, Nick, have fun, I think it would be very, very. There were some amazing pieces just laying around Blade Show, and I just walk right by those tables because they. I, I can't buy it. I'm not going to review it. There's really no point to it. But I, I, when I do stop, there's mastery there. There is true mastery at a level way beyond the soup de jour level. And so I'd love to have something there from one of those people who is just like, oh my God, you are so good at this. Okay, so let me let me let me narrow it down with without yeah. getting specific. Would it be more on the art knifey side with like really uh, exotic and fancy materials, or would it be more on the Damascus, uh, you know, kind of roughly hewn, uh, you know, Bowie knife? It were refined, but you know, I I like at some level there's a there's a good intersection. I think um, there are people who are uh, sort of your your good really well forged Damascus fixed blade, but with every detail perfectly done. Mm -hmm. Like if they are polishing the chamfers on the back of the big brass butt cap <laughs> of the damn thing, that's where I'm at. Right. Okay. So the people who you. are very clearly, they're bound, uh, they're, they're focused on tradition, but they are really trying their best to fully and excellently execute that piece. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who really impress me most is just like, you have made a Bowie knife or, or whatever it is that is just perfect in you every damn way. David Lespect, I, I follow him, uh, the the French yeah. knife maker. He, yep. he makes fixed blades. I follow him on Instagram. And, yep, he does yeah, some man, fixed blades. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. And and it it looks like it just feel nice to hold and kind of, yeah. you know, play Absolutely. with. Absolutely. But you're not yeah. going to be doing much work with it. But. Exactly. And that's the thing. That would be a collectible for me. That would just be like, and at some level, I'm thinking about my collection more and more in that way. This is a change I felt recently in my own personal collection is I'm trying to, because it's very easy in, in the position of being somebody in the knife community to end up hoarding, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm trying to figure out what my collection should look like and you know what should stick around, what should not. And previously, it's been functional categories, but I'm realizing that you know there's a joy to having more than one you know, a harder use sort of knife. And so I'm thinking, I'm kind of like, I want, I, I, I want to curate a little bit more. I think you had Epic Snuggle Bunny on the, mm -hmm. uh, yes, on the podcast talking about that. And, you know, it's, it's like, um, refine, yeah, exactly. And so I'm just trying to find some of the very best of those things. So if I'm going to have a crazy Damascus buoy, I want one that is just amazing. It is just like, this is a perfect example of this art. Yeah. It's it's interesting that you use the word curate because that's a word I meant to bring up with him uh, in our last interview because it's something I'm trying to avoid. Like I am not a curator. I am not yeah. here to to uh, uh, preserve uh, knife history in the oh. late uh, early twentieth twenty uh, first. And and so I'll find myself like, oh well, I need to hold on to this ZT zero zero five five, even though it's totally ridiculous yeah. because <laughs> it's an example of this ridiculousity, and I need to yeah. have it in my. I, yeah, this these are the kind of things that's the dead wood I have to burn off. And I'm with you 100 percent there. I think there's a role, for instance, for emotional curation. Like, for instance, there are knives that I have that are, are not ever going to be for sale that are, because they mean something to me. Mm -hmm. And that's a different thing. But I agree. You know, I a couple of times now I've found myself trying to do that of like, oh, well, now I've got one before and after the change. Or, you know, I've got a large <laughs> yeah. and a small. Yeah. Or, yeah. And yeah. each time I do it, I just feel like a jerk because it's like I'll, one of these is one I slightly prefer. And why yeah. do I have two of these? When Ernest Emerson starts paying me to be his uh, you know, biographer, <laughs> I will collect every Emerson knife. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a brand that I'm a sucker for. I, 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 I love that wave. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's just the that's 
the angle I'm coming at it from. So, no, um, it's totally so, reasonable. So, so what is your uh, folding knife choice? Uh, your your uh, locking modern folder. My uh, locking can I modern. Guess? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, is it the chamois. No, actually, I don't think so. Um, so I like very much Garrett's work. I think he does some amazing stuff, and I've actually owned a couple of chamois um, already. And you know, the, my lack of ownership is not you know because they're bad in any way. I mean. He's doing great stuff. Um, ah, in terms of a high end folder, money is no option. Um, or money is no uh, issue. Oh man, uh, Philippe Georget is a, a, a French dude. Um, he did the CKF fifth twenty three. Weird name. Yeah, a very weird name. But um, you know, he did that piece and handling his stuff he falls again into that category of sort of uh he's not trying to do everything but he's doing it amazingly well my buddy mike actually ended up with his auction piece at a price that was surprisingly good i want to say it was like 28 something which is uh, surprisingly good (laughs) yeah uh anyways um but you know he did things like that the clip was time ask but he just anodized it blue so from afar, it looks like it's just regular titanium. Oh, wow. But if you come up close, it's like, holy crap, this is an intricate time basket. It's kind of like the reverse of uh, of um, impressionism. You know, up close, it's like just a bunch of splotches of color. And then you back up and it forms a picture. Exactly. Yeah. And all of the details were just there beautifully. And like, you know, he chamfered the inside of the lighters, but he also mirror polished the chamfers. Oh, yeah, I know. Right. That's classy. It, it, mm. That's the thing. It was just so damn classy. And not not only that, but but how can you not? And this is going to sound a little flaky, but how can yeah. you not imbue a thing with your soul if you're spending that much time that you're polishing, ch- you know, chamfers? Yes, absolutely. And, and it's going to give that knife more value. Exactly. And so handling that piece, it was like looking at this. The person thought about every element of it and did his best to make everything. And so that particular knife, I'll admit that that particular version isn't to my taste as much. The design itself isn't to my taste, but I handled some of his other stuff and he just does this amazing, amazing work. And I would be very happy and proud to own one of those things, but I probably wouldn't pay the, you know, three grand it would cost to get some of them. I mean, yeah. So again, that's in that stay, that's in that mastery level. Like I would buy for mastery if money weren't an option and availability weren't a problem. I would want a piece that is just like, this is about as good as folding knife gets. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one thing. Protex Investor Collector Series, is that, that's their name, not mine. Um, have you seen these? Like I have. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big Protex fan. Yeah, Protex does amazing stuff. And these are weird in that they are fundamentally a Protex sprint or a Protex brand. There's something like a brand that is. But then they have gone that extra mile with every element of it, with the engraving, with the materials. I, I, did you say you have the Brend? No, I have the Sprint. Oh, oh the Sprint. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, no, no, no. Brend is the next one I want to get. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, the Brend is an amazing freaking knife, and they but they brought one there that was just like I, I remember looking at it, and going uh, and talking to somebody from Protech and saying, you know, okay, I'm going to ask this question. How much? He said, oh, well, this one is configured is about ten grand. Like, <laughs> if you have to ask, sir. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it was already sold by the time the show uh, started. Mm. And, of course, it won Best Investor Collector piece because, of course, it did. You know, right. people look at these online and it just kind of looks a little bit like Gaudi. But then you handle one. Mm-hmm. I, and I said this at Protech. Like, they handed me one. It was just like, holy sh-. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's another example of something I might pick up. And that engraving is yes. just, I, I can't remember who the gentleman is, but it takes him quite a good deal of time to, to do that. It's not just something yeah. you pop in a laser engraver and it's, it, this is handmade yeah. stuff. There's mastery there. And in similarly in some of the CNC stuff, I mean, the whole, uh, whole knife works. I keep hyping them because I'm really happy with this. Yes. Yeah. They're what's really, their, what's their model? Uh, the Spectre is what they're working on at the moment. They've got another yes, one that's yes, coming up, but, yeah, um, right. you know, I, I've ordered my most expensive knife that I've ever ordered, single most that I've ordered from them, and it's almost done. It's going to be a f- kind of as close to full dress as they come mm-hmm. with a Damascus blade, Damascus handle inlays, a Damasteel that is on both sides, and then blue with their – it's going to be completely freaking Rococo, to use the art term. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I 
am such a big fan of their that the level of CNC mastery, of design mastery that they show that it's just like this is a knife that is good enough to merit that. I had a recent conversation uh, with uh, the guys from Fair and Forge, yeah, and, and something about them that really. Um, is interesting to me is how they've taken what was once a very solitary activity and they're not the only ones and, and turned it into a collaborative process. And I'm in yeah. the, I'm in the video television production world and I understand collaboration and the value of it in creating yeah. something. And um, when I hear you talk about uh, uh, the, um, the specter, which is a knife that's made on CNC yeah. It, that that is in and of itself is going to sound creepy, but it's like a collaboration, collaborating with that machine to get that thing that you're programming to do to to create something so subtle and and you know finessed is yeah. that's pretty amazing. It's kind of like a collaboration right there. And both and Joe and Angie are uh, the, 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 those are the Holtz um, uh, oh, okay. are, are both involved in it at different levels. I mean, Angie does a lot of the titanium atomization stuff, a lot of the finishing, polishing. And Joe's doing the, you know, so yeah, I think collaboration and the Ferrum oh, Forge stuff, by the way, have you handled any of their engraved stuff? Negative. So no, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Ferrum Forge is like 20 minutes that way. Oh, from me. Nice, nice. Yeah. So I, you know, I'll go down and visit them periodically just because I, I find them entertaining folks. And, <laughs> yeah. and, but the stuff that they've got there, I mean, when, um, when Elliot sits down with his Dremel and does, he's got this Geiger style, um, biomechanical thing that's yeah, just yeah. like yeah and i i understand completely that it is not necessarily to my taste but i can appreciate that it is amazing yes and so i i love 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 um that kind of high-end stuff that they're doing and uh you know the fact that they're doing it on these production versions are uh it's just good all right all right so slip joint I know slip you're not joint. a huge slip joint guy. I love, uh, I, I go in and out. I have seasons with slip yeah. joints and, and I, I'm a big fan of GEC. And yeah. I also, uh, I like to slum it with case. Sorry, case. I don't mean it like that. But in terms of, uh, <laughs> I know. you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I mean, if you want to cut, then. I, yeah, I'll, exactly. Anyway, anyway. What's the um, joke? Case, uh, case knives are for people who like collecting more than they like knives. <laughs> um, I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you had, I, I have yeah. a feeling I know what your answer for this is also. Yeah. Uh, but if you had to pick a, 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 a slip joint, what would it be? Oh, um, this is my, from the last uh, show, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my answer to this is probably Pena, um, which is probably what you were expecting. Yep. Um, I, I like Enrique a lot as a human. Mm -hmm. You know, he and I. So speaking of makers who actually, um, yeah, I don't think he'd have a problem with my saying this. He's a maker who has actually reached out to me. Um, you know, independently before any, uh, you know, I'd looked at a couple of his things and he, he's had a very, he's expressed very positive sentiments about some of the things I've said, um, and said, you know, although he definitely disagrees with me on some things and isn't afraid to say, no, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I, I don't like it. That, that's great. But, you know, he's been a person who's been very, very, very interested in feedback, not just open to it, but like Nick, tear it apart. I mm -hmm. want to hear what you're going to complain about because right. even if I don't fix it, I'll know. And so I like him just as a human, and he's a really nice guy independently of all of this. But I've also come to really appreciate him as a craftsman. Um, you know, he is another person that puts down the little custom Benya front flipper uh, trap rod got. Mm -hmm. Like he sent that to mm -hmm. me, and I he sent it to me as just a Nick. I want you to check this out. You know, I've never you've never had one of my customs that was you know in that more traditional vein. I want to see what you think about it. And my feeling was basically like, holy sh. Like, I, I think I had it for like 30 minutes before I messaged, I PayPal'd him. And it was just like, <laughs> yeah. Because I look at it, it's just like, yeah, you, yeah. you nailed it. There were things that I don't like as much about the design, but they're inconsequential. And so he and I are working on something that might, uh, in the charitable vein where yeah. he's going to provide something that I can then do a charitable sale for. Um, and it's going to be one of his custom slip joints. And I'm really scared I'm going to like it. <laughs> I've handled one of his customs before. But Those if starving I, kids can uh, wait uh, just to, for him to make another one. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, but no. Um, so if I if it, didn't, if it couldn't be Enrique, um, Bill Rubel would be the other person. Okay. Because he's Bill Rubel. I, I say mean, okay, but I'm totally unfamiliar with his work. I, I believe he's the guy who taught Pena. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and you handle his stuff, and it's just like, oh, 
Well, yes. Yes, indeed. Um, so very, very impressive work. Um, very impressive. So I, uh, but I would say those two are the, the people I would be most interested in the slip joint from at this point. Hmm. Um, and I, I do appreciate them more and more as I come to use them because they are the perfect Starbucks knife. It comes back to that, they right? They are indeed. They're the perfect cut your, cut your sandwich in half at work knife. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my grandpa used to have something like that. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. everyone feels great when you put it away. The traditional side of things, I think, is another thing I've grown a lot of on as a reviewer of like going to appreciate those things a lot more. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the history, again, not at the curation level, but just like there were a lot of things that we knew in traditional knives that have been forgotten in modern knives. And I think there's a there's a synthesis here that's happening that I'm seeing happening in the mm -hmm. industry and I'm loving. So, yeah. So do you think there's a future for these modern slip joints made oh, yeah. by, you know, Benchmade or Lion Steel? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that not only will those sell better, because right now one of the biggest issues I see facing the knife market is saturation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to sell, you know, well, okay, I'm an easy mark, but it may be hard to sell uh, an enthusiast, somebody who follows Benchmade on Instagram. It's hard to sell them another knife yeah, because they've already got one they love. And we're reaching the point where you have all the functional utility you need in a you know, $120 piece or something like that. I mean, for many people, in a $20 piece. So I think getting more people interested in the pocket knife world is a, something that is going to be a good thing. And I think things like the bench made proper, things like mm -hmm. you know really nice modern slip joints are a way to do that. Because yeah. that's going to get somebody who is a, you know, uh, the skinny jeans and suspenders crowd. <laughs> okay, all right. You brought it up. So to me, the hipster knife. Yeah, uh, the James brand. Yeah, I don't know absolutely. anything about them, but to me, that seems like a hipster brand. Oh, it is. Uh, just from the name and all that. And yep. uh, and uh, Shinola. Yep, Shinola. Shinola. And they, Benchmade went in with Shinola, which was oh, a brilliant move. Yes. They're selling some Benchmades with, you know, wooden handles at Shinola. One of the smartest damn things Benchmade has done in a long time. Yes. Um, you know, those kinds of brands are, although we might make fun of them, and certainly, you know, they're a part. I, I'm a hipster. I'll admit this at some level. but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the there will be elements of the knife community who are perhaps less happy with that truce. Um, I think that's a really good place for us to grow, because if we can get people who are already sitting in the coffee shop, very happy with, you know, nice pocket knives, that makes the pocket shop or the coffee shop acceptability of a given knife much higher. Thank you. Yeah. It, it, that's exactly that's exactly it. Like I have a resistance only because I'm not particularly fond of the knife designs, but that's, they're just not in my particular line, you know, taste. Yeah. But the fact that it's, I don't know, it's kind of like bringing them out in the open. Absolutely. We're going to have a little speed round where I'm just going to ask uh -oh. you uh, to, to answer, you know, one or the other. But before we get uh -oh. there, I want to, I want to broach the topic of materialism. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I never, I, I bristled at, at the concept of being a collector for a long time. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, once I got my giant craftsman tool drawer chest full, <laughs> I had to admit, like, this, this seems to look like a collection. <laughs> yep. um, and now I'm like, geez, I don't need all these. And yeah. they're hard to part with. It's weird. Yep. Um, so where's the, where's the line between being a collector slash curator doing important work oh <laughs> and <laughs> and someone who's just being a materialistic uh, kind of scumbag so i actually have a video on this it's called nick's take on materialism in the gear world that you know some people might find interesting but my my basic feeling on it is that and i feel this even more strongly in the watch world where it's like the the amount of money is an order of magnitude higher in the watch game. And I've managed to stay very low in that price range, which feels very high to the rest of the world, but still. Um, I think that there's, it's really hard to say. I mean, for me, the difference between materialism and what I'm trying to do as a gear reviewer, I'm, I'm materialism. I'm promoting that. I can't deny this. I'm probably not a healthy force for the world in, you know, I'm exposing people to things that they might not have known they wanted to buy. I mean, there's a joy in that. And for some people, it will bring them joy to have a better tool. And I'm helping people at that level. But I can't pretend I'm anything other than a tool of the, you know, the, 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 the knife industrial complex. <laughs> um, I, I, I can't 
I'm not capable of BSing myself that effectively. Mm-hmm. But for me, I think the difference becomes the art element of it, the mastery element of it. You know, if you buy, and I don't want to, you know, impugn people who only, per, you know, just who buy every production knife from a given company. Mm-hmm. You know, for them, that may be a collecting thing. It may just be, I want to have every Benchmade. I want to have every Spyderco. Well, cool. If that brings you joy, then great. If it's bringing you more joy than it is financial harm, or then that's amazing. Have fun. You found the you found the joy. But for me, the real change occurred when I realized that Pete, there was a quality difference, right? That there were amazing pieces, and there were really uninteresting pieces. And so when I'm trying to find this stuff that's great, um, and I'm trying to appreciate the work of the artist, whether that's the the person making it by hand, in the case of a handmade custom, the person programming the CNC, or the designer of the piece, the producer of the, the factory. That makes it to me, there's a level of appreciation. I look at something in my collection and it brings me a a joy because I know not only that this is an excellent tool for actually accomplishing things, but also because I respect what has been done and I want to support the people who are doing it. That's the closest I can come to making this feel okay. I I think that, I think that is the, (laughs) I like the way you put that, but I think that is the way everyone has to kind of, uh, you, you mentioned Epic Snuggle Bunny, that's kind of the same message. Yeah. At first, you go through the the first blush, and you get as your hands on as much as you can, and then eventually those go away, and you, and you, you keep moving up tier-wise, and eventually you're just like, well, really the essence of this is the quality of the thing and the capability yeah. of the thing. And then, and then there's that uh, intangible third part. It exactly. just resonates with me, you know? Well, and that's the other thing is, you know, if it's a collection that look, Marie Kondo, the whole, uh, I forget the name of this whole thing. It's um, basically, it's a book on minimalism, but the idea is, oh, you know, yeah, does yeah, it yeah. spark joy, right? Yep, yep. I think there's some joy in that. I think that idea sparks joy. Of just like if I look at every knife in my collection, and my collection is actually relatively small relative to many people's um, in terms of permanent things that are in my little toolbox, so to speak. Um, But if every one of those things brings me joy when I look at it, whether it reminds me of a, you know, whether I just like it as an object, whether it reminds me of something beautiful, whether I like the maker that made it, and therefore it also is nice. You know, if all of those things are there, then looking, picking out the knife that I carry that day, the watch that I wear that day, the pen that I'm using, is itself a joyful act. It's a meditative thing, and it makes me feel a little bit more ready, not necessarily in the sense of I really expect I'm going to need that kind of knife today, yeah. but just ready in the, the, the emotional sense for the rest of my day. There's something therapeutic about that independently, but that's because I'm insane. So, you know. yeah yeah well you want to feel fully dressed and oh exactly fully yes. dressed without a sweet knife in your front right exactly yeah. and then probably one in your left and then maybe one in, in the waistband in case you get uh, knocked over in baltimore or something like that so i, I want to manage to stick the one generally but <laughs> there's the temptation many days because <laughs> it's like so many to play with so few days and i have to re- i have so many things i have to review it's just like carrying something from my collection has become a rare treat at this point, really? so yeah, yeah, yeah. You must have a table full of knives that uh, you need to like get to. Ten of them sitting over there right now, with three more sitting at my PO box. So it's a process. Kind of cool, but I would imagine also kind of pressure. You know, you know like I, anything else. I'm a very lucky man. I, as much as th- there can occasionally be frustrations, where it's like I get something amazing in the mail. And I really, really, really need to get to this thing that's just going to be okay. Mm, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't trade it. You know, I, I'm a very, very lucky man, and I'm very grateful to the people in the community who've helped that be a thing for me. So do you get stuff, uh, do you get products from makers, and they say, check this out, but don't say anything about it? Yeah, I do a lot of self-reviews. God, that's got that's got to be not, not hard because you don't want to betray anyone's trust, but I mean, that's got to... I know something. I know something you don't know. There's a level of that. You know, I, I joke that I've gotten very good at forgetting things. <laughs> um, but I do have a prototype shelf in my in my office where it's just like, and it's well far away from anything on the camera. Mm-hmm. So that way I know that anything up there, I can't, like, I can't accidentally bring it on during a live right, even stream. Even if there's an earthquake and it falls onto the table, or it falls, it's not going to fall onto the exactly, table. Exactly, yeah. Well, if I got falling knives, I got bigger problems. <laughs> but, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but so there's definitely there's that factor of it. And, you know, there are a lot of people who talk with me about things that are up and coming. And so I try to be careful about those kinds of questions. But, mm-hmm. and you know, it's it's nice because very often I know something is excellent before it comes down the pipe. So I can jump right on it and have a production version, you know, go and buy it day one for a review or in some cases ask them to send a production version so I'm ready. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, there's definitely that element of it, too. You know, I keep saying we're going to get to the speed round, but there's there, there are a couple other things. Oh, uh, I'm happy. Keep uh, uh, something, something I, I, you know, uh, you and a lot of other YouTubers are very clear about, uh, if you don't mind my calling you that, yes. is is when um, uh, a, a sample is sent to you from the company. And I, I yep. love the way you say we must assume that this is the best version of this knife that's ever been made. Yeah. And that I will not, uh, to the best of my abilities, allow this fact that it was sent to me by the manufacturer to color yeah. my my review how, how obviously you find that important why well i mean partly because i feel like it's really it's ugly if i don't do that right because mm-hmm. if i don't tell people where and i just make a habit now of thanking somebody for every knife like at, at the start of every recent review you will see you know thanks to my buddy x who loaned it my way thanks to my patreon patrons for making buying this possible or thanks to this company for sending it along with that disclaimer but you know to me it feels like if i'm getting something from a company and i'm not disclosing that there are so many factors involved in that that it just feels like it feels corrupt in some level mm-hmm. I feel confident that I could do a review of a knife that a company sent me, not tell anybody that that was what went on, and it would still be a fair review. I, I feel like I would be able to do that. But I also very much don't want people, because for some people, they're going to say, I don't trust any review that's provide on a review, not a review sample. And you know what? They're welcome not to trust me. That's their prerogative, but I want them to know that. Yes. And I want people to be able to make the assumption, because maybe I am nice at a review samples. I don't think I am. But, you know, maybe I am. And so I want that to be a factor that goes into people's calculus as they're hearing me. And, you know, so I I just I need that information to be out there because otherwise it's just corruption, at least in my mind. Uh, The one time I don't do that, and that's for uh, legal reasons, so to speak, not legal, but um, is if somebody has sent me a stealth review version of something beforehand. So if somebody has sent me, for instance, a prototype of a knife mm-hmm. six months ago, and then I get the full version on my on my channel later on, I do not say thank you to you know so and so for sending me this knife six months ago for a stealth review, mm-hmm. and then giving it to you know in a couple of occasions and then taking makers, my advice and making it much better. <laughs> it, well, a that yeah that's that's kind of cocky as heck, anyways. But um, b uh, there there have been a couple of occasions where the maker I've asked the maker and they've cleared it. They've mm-hmm. said they've allowed me to say that and, you know, in a couple of cases, even to talk about what was different, um, which was fun. Like the boost blade smoke, I did that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I don't disclose that because, A, um, I mean, it, it plays a role. But also, I am not – I don't want to muddy the waters there. Sure. I don't want makers to – I don't want the knife to take on any kind of a sheen from me in either direction. Yeah, well, you don't want people to say, wait, 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 what did Nick Shabazz have to do with this knife again? Exactly. Because uh, then people like... will be asking, what did you what did you tell him to fix? Yeah. And yeah. then that gets into questions like, you know, oh, well, you know, they, 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 they their factory had trouble with X. And that's just ugly. So that's the one thing I don't disclose. And partly it's because makers don't want me to disclose that I'm looking at these products ahead of time. And I respect that. I understand that. And that's... That's something I'm more than happy to do in those situations. I mean, you 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 are uh, a proven quantity, and you're and you're giving them a valuable service. So I, I could, you know, yeah. Why would you disclose exactly? So and it also it gives information about like their shipping timetables and things like that. Oh right. Like right. if I see a prototype eight months ago and now it landed, yeah, that tells that's that's it. Yeah. So yeah. in that case, I will still always disclose it was sent to me by the maker, etc. But I won't necessarily mention that there was a stealth review done. Right. I, right. You know, I I don't think there's a way around that. But again, I try my best not to let that affect things in, in my in my review, and I always try to review the knife that's on my table right now, not the one that was on my table previously or. You know, and not let that make me bitter about, well, they didn't fix yeah. X. And you're kind of at this point a self policing entity because you've already released yeah. to the world what, what your criteria are and uh, you, you've already let 
let the world know what you think is a value. So if, yeah. if you start BS and people catch on pretty quick. And people call me out on that on a regular basis. Like, Nick, I'm sorry. If this came from any other company, you would be. And in some cases, mm. there have been places where it's a little bit accurate. Like, you know, I've not commented on the color of something. And it was very like, OK, JG10. I didn't. There was one point where I didn't care a knife apart for JG10. I love JG10. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that you may feel that way. <laughs> and you die yours. I understand. Uh, yes, I you love M4 I, steel so much. I either die it or I die inside. It's a question of which one. Um, but you know, people will call me out on that. At some level, they're providing a service. I think in some cases it's fair, and some in a few cases it's been fair. But in other cases, it's just like. Okay, yeah, sure, whatever. You can say that. Yeah. But it would be very hard for me to just start, you know, giving a pass. And I've had companies who I work with who, you know, send me review samples have said to me, and I agree with them, that if I were to just throw the review and just talk about the good and the great and let something clear go, then I would lose all credibility. And every review of that knife and those forward would be meaningless and it wouldn't help them either. Yeah. And they so wouldn't I make think any companies money. want that. Yeah. They want the brute, you know, they, in some cases, I've had companies say, yeah, we earned that one. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we'll fix that in the future, but that, that's fair. So I think it is win-win if I am honest all around, no matter if it's sent to me by the company or otherwise. And companies that try and exert any force in the process, I don't accept samples from. I'll tell them to screw right off. I have a disclaimer that states very explicitly. And very often, I just never feature those companies. All right. Because I don't even... I don't want to come anywhere freaking near them. If they're that, I can't recommend them. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it starts to sound like payola and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't care for any of that. And I get a lot of offers for like, oh, you know, and usually it's, you know, $20 Amazon knives, but it's just <laughs> like, nope. All right, Nick. Well, I've, 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 uh, monopolized your time for no for you're fine a, about an hour i i have some burning speed round questions please and uh these are kind of standard and i think i know the answer to most of them yeah but uh i, I want to hear your immediate answer bring it on all right fixed or folder folder flipper or thumb stud ah flipper probably washers or bearings ah, i want to see more knives on washers okay tip up or tip down this is it, it, it's not a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't even. Yeah, tip up. I, the, 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 tip up or wrong is the correct way to phrase that. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Tanto or Bowie? Oh, that's a weird dichotomy. Uh, Tanto, I guess. All right. Yeah. Hollow, hollow ground or flat ground? Uh, I know you're saying a... there's stipulations. But yeah, I want to stipulate like crazy, but <laughs> generally a tall, flat grind will be a little bit better than a bad hollow grind in production. Okay, okay. A little more than, than a one-word answer, but... I'll yeah, 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 yeah. Full size or small? Small. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Gentleman's. Automatic or ballet song? Automatic. I'm less likely to hurt myself that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's one. Gavco or Tough Knives? Ah, uh, Gavco? <laughs> ZT or We? We. Benchmade or Spyderco? Spyderco. Milled Titanium or Spring? Uh, milled Titanium or what? Oh, I'm sorry. Milled Titanium or Spring Clip? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, probably Spring Clip. All right. Carbon Fiber or Micarta? Uh, carbon fiber. Finger choil or none? <laughs> Finger choil. <laughs> Form or function? Uh, function. And finally, your desert knife. The one for the rest of your life. Uh, I... <laughs> what a slash buoy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, That's a good answer. Okay, why? Just tell me why. I, I have a whole video where I agonize on this. I, I <laughs> because I, it's the night that stopped my collecting for like two years. That that and finishing graduate school that helped stop it too. No, oh, well, yeah, I could see yeah. why that. But but when you got the sleeve spur, you're like, okay, knives are done. They did it. They won. This no, is I it. mean it, it was just like this. What it was a knife that is. It remains so damn good in so many ways that all the other knives in my collection are. There are many knives that are equivalently excellent to it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some knives that, technically speaking, are, are a little bit better. 
but it is just such a good option for me that I, I really, really struggle to say, you know, that there's something better out there. I mean, as an all arounder, it's really hard to do a lot better than that in my estimation. And to me personally, to my eye, it is beautiful. Yes. That beautiful looking knife. And I've the acoustics of it are just like, yeah, when that thing locks up, you just look, "Mm." I I have to, I've only ever heard it on video. I have the Spidey chef, which I love. And if that's any indication, I, I, the sleash buoy someday. If the spy, look, if the chef, if the buoy was off the table, the chef would be a really good contender as well. It's an awesome knife. It is so damn good. It's it so really, awesome. Really I put is. a little leather fob on mine, which is like, you're mine. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, Nick Shabazz. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Today. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Yep. Wonderful. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Wow, Bob, a lot to uh, really take in there with that conversation with Nick, man. Just a lot of, uh, as we said on the intro, a lot of great conversation, a lot of great uh, great knife talking there. Yeah, I could have I could have kept going. I got to say, maybe we'll have <laughs> Nick back on. But it's a funny thing. You get two knife nerds together and the conversation just rolls. Right, right. <laughs> so what, what uh, boil it down for me. What uh, what what did you take away from that interview? Well, you know, there's there was a lot in that interview and uh, it was really cool to get his uh, his perspective on things for sure. But uh, to me, like the overarching idea that came out of this is that you can't account for taste. Uh, Nick and I have different tastes in knives and there's no accounting for taste, but you can you can set objective criteria that you can judge a knife on. And then and then that's how two parties with differing opinions can actually have a conversation about something that they don't agree on. So not only is this a knife issue, but it's a it's a wider issue. You know, agree on, on a couple of uh, positive criteria. It's good for a blade to be centered. It's good for a knife to uh, to have good action, et cetera, et cetera. That can be objective criteria. From there, your opinions can can rule. And uh, so that's how two people with differing opinions can talk about something they disagree on yeah well and everybody has different taste you know so yeah there exactly. you go. that's what makes collecting of any kind of thing uh collecting because if everybody liked the same thing you'd only have one of everything <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah all right that's gonna uh, wrap it up for uh, this episode of the knife junkie podcast another uh, great one coming up next week do want you to uh, stick around and listen for that but yeah. uh we've had a couple of new subscribers to the newsletter the past couple of weeks so i just don't want to uh uh, forget to mention that again. If you're not on the Knife Junkie uh, newsletter list, go to the knifejunkie.com slash subscribe and you can get uh, Bob's weekly musings about uh, the knife world and what's going on. And especially with uh, his reduce and refine quest, kind of get an <laughs> idea of what's going on with there. So the knifejunkie.com slash subscribe. Bob, another great show in the can, as they say. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for doing it. Oh, it, it's been my pleasure. Believe me. The Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.